The year was 2001. An independent team of Croatians created one seriously badass dude. Serious Sam was his name. And this is how it all began. The year is 1992. A small team of four developers from Zagreb, Croatia grouped together to create Crow Team. They also spelled Crow Team with a capital T, something that had only really changed with the release of Serious Sam the First Encounter in 2001, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. By 1997, they had 12 developers working for them, expecting to expand in the coming years. For the first part of their development years, their main focus was, surprisingly, in contrast to their presence today, sports games. However, before Crow Team developed their own games, they helped a team of developers called Beyond Arts. It started out on the personal home computer, the Commodore Amiga 500, and a little game called Embryo in 1994. Embryo was a rather large game at the time, retailing with five individual discs for play. It is a flight simulator, unlike those which Microsoft has been made famous for. This game focuses more on combat than realism. The game's storyline involves an unknown darkness webbing the surface. Your role as a pilot is to undergo a suicide mission, to eliminate as many of this darkness' as weapons as possible, in order to give the human race one last fighting chance. It is certainly a unique game, albeit very primitive compared to FA-18 Interceptor, which came out six years earlier on the same Amiga 500 hardware. By this point, games like Tactical Fighter Experiment had already seen the light of day. It should be considered that TFX, for short, was released on far superior hardware, but it still managed to come out a year prior to Embryo. As a result, 1994's Embryo didn't stand much of a chance to stand out, despite being a respectable effort on their inferior hardware. Later on, during the same year, Crow Team released their very first true video game. It was a game called Football Glory, which, like Embryo, was also made for the Amiga 500. For those of us who are American or Canadian, we know this sport as soccer. This was a 2D sports game. As such, it didn't have to tackle the obstacle of 3D space, and was much more presentable as a product. It was also ported to the DOS operating system the next year. It served a decent run, selling an undetermined number of copies, but certainly enough to keep the company going, as it scored second place on the Commodore Amiga sales chart. Four years after its initial launch, it became freeware. That means it was entirely legal to distribute it for free. 1998 was a different time for Crow Team. It was this year when they created Five Aside Soccer. Alas, this wasn't their next effort after Football Glory. In 1995, they created a game called Save the Earth for the Amiga 4000, hardware much greater than anything previously they had developed for. The game was designed for a program on Croatian national TV called Turbo Limac Show. This was a competitive show for children entertainment. The show itself was focused on carnival-style gaming and occasionally demonstrated various contestants' singing abilities. It's an odd mix for sure, and there was undoubtedly more to it. Simply put, when it comes to such a topic, being unable to speak Croatian leaves a lot behind in translation. There's little to no documentation on the game on the web, though after an hour or so of searching, I did manage to find two screenshots. They aren't much, but they can still serve to provide a concept for the imagination. It is now considered lost media on the Amiga Games site Hall of Light. We may never see genuine footage of this game, unless it was actually demonstrated in the Croatian show itself. Other than this, the game may no longer exist. The same year, they assisted in the development of a DOS title called Inordinate Desire, developed by Virtual Arts. Inordinate Desire was a turn-based strategy game where your goal is to conquer foreign planets. You had the choice of viewing statistics, repairing ships, setting up patrol pilots, and buying new units. You could progress by then ordering attacks or advancements, and then pursuing threats that come into your way. Call it a pseudo-Star Trek sort of experience. At this point, it's clear that when it came to science fiction, capitalizing space territories and planets was a pulling force for Crow Team. After a three-year hiatus, Crow Team was found assisting Olympia Software for their new game, Evil's Doom, a fantasy RPG for the Amiga 1200. During the same period, on the same specifications, they released Five Aside Soccer in 1998 for the Amiga 1200. Upon first impression, one may associate it with their earlier game, Football Glory, and appropriately so. Essentially, this was a rehash of Football Glory. Crow Team likely at this point viewed Football Glory as an inferior product and gave it up as freeware, perhaps to further promote interest in their revamped release, Five Aside Soccer. 
Football Glory still, however, had the edge of being playable on older hardware, giving those lagging behind the opportunity to play a game they may have skipped over. Five Aside Soccer could have very well been a side project, as two years prior to its release, Crow Team began working on the very concept which made them the gaming icon they are today. In the later months of 1996, Crow Team began working on a 2.5D engine called Escape 3D. Their idea was to make a first-person shooter similar to Doom, with a larger emphasis on immersion. In this new game they had begun developing, titled Flesh, the idea was to provide a setting with 20-plus monster types to fight off. Most progressively, the game featured the ability to separate an enemy's individual limbs, an idea that just might have been the first of its kind for video gaming. Of course, with such an idea, there would require the necessary motives to do so. This is where one may consider the immersion effect Flesh had, the ambition of giving the player total control over the decisions in-game. The only existing screenshots of Flesh demonstrate fog effects and mood lighting. However, these screenshots are more likely from a further development point, as at this point the game had been renamed from Flesh to In the Flesh. As a more recent reference, Crow Team has publicly stated in reply to Carlo Gustav Krivek that In the Flesh had the same weapon models and textures with the colorless HUD to the Sirius Sam Alpha. I've personally photoshopped an example of what this could look like on screen. After In the Flesh, Crow Team began to tease their new game simply titled Sirius Sam. But how did they come up and settle with this new name? Roman Rabaric, the CEO of Crow Team, decided to have the character's name represent the product. Something similar to Duke Nukem, he mentioned. Before changing the name, Rubaric decided to change the original scenery instead of using a hellish environment to use bright open environments, something very rare in the FPS genre at the time, showing similarity only to Power Slave, a game developed by Lobotomy Software in 1996 for the Sega Saturn, PlayStation, and DOS computer system. The earliest screenshots of Sirius Sam indicate that it was a much bigger game. There was no first, second, or third encounter, which, by the way, was originally intended to be the finale for the first installment. The three eventually planned encounters can be paralleled in the early build of Sirius Sam. Sirius Sam's Alpha was a completely different story when compared to its final design. 40 levels, in transition to the resulting 15 at release, is a bit of a shocker. The number of enemies was also severely reduced, and to a lesser extent, the weaponry. There are also a number of mysteries that still plague the Alpha. Why didn't the Fishman make it into the final version of the game? Why are there no biomechs to be seen, yet the files remain intact? And did this rumored Lava Rocks gun ever actually make it into the game? After the concept for In the Flesh was scrapped, the team began to work on new entities, particularly enemy designs and weapons for a game with a much greater scale. In the transition, there was one entity which ultimately got the boot without any possibility of making it back into the concepts for the game. This was the Lava Rocks Gun. The Lava Rocks Gun shot tiny lava projectiles in a fashion similar to the Laser Gun, which was the real reason why the Lava Rocks Gun was scrapped. They were practically two of the same, and Crow Team saw no real reason to keep both. As homage, the Lava Rocks Gun and even the later scrapped Ghostbuster weapon were given to Uggzon 3 in the final version of the game alongside a laser gun cannon and rocket launcher. Enemies from In the Flesh were continued into this new game. In the Flesh featured seven enemies in total. Catmen, Headmen, besides the Kamikaze, Mammoth, Harpies, and the Devil, being Uggzon in his earliest form. The Catman was the very first enemy created for In the Flesh, who was intended to take part in the earlier Serious Sam builds but never made it. In fact, there have been no discovered screenshots of the Catman in-game. He has only ever been spotted in promotional mock-ups and user icons from the engine. With that in mind, it's possible that the Catman wasn't planned to be in their new game for very long at all. The revamp is available to spawn in Serious Sam Revolution, a Crow Team-supported port of the original Serious Sam releases, which contains many elements from the earlier builds of Serious Sam. This has been speculated to tie in with the Serious Sam Origins release once Revolution gets closer to leaving its early access beta, something which has unfortunately been the case for years as of this video. Origins is of no exception, also being absent from the scene for equally as long. Next came the map mockups, because what game is without its levels? The design got rather frantic as many different worlds were created. A planet made entirely of lava, fire, and rock, and a planet made entirely out of ice and water, as two notable examples. More entities were made around the time, including a fairly unique spawning system with their newly created elementals. The water elementals are the first of their type to be found in the alpha build, and as this one transitional screenshot implies, it would have been the first elemental created. Here is the earliest known title screen for Sirius Sam, possibly being the first presentable render of it. It featured single player, multiplayer, demonstration, options, and of course a selection to quit the game. It also had the technology test, which seems to have only changed cosmetically over time. 
the only missing option from this early title screen in comparison to the Alpha 2000 build would be the network option, implemented later into the game's development. Things really took off once the early build had been established. This period covers just before, during, and after the 2000 Alpha build which had been leaked. Many of the screenshots from this era are no different from moments seen in the Alpha build, for the most part there isn't much to make note of there. The leak build was lacking a few major elements of the game, which we can see in screenshots scattered around the web. The later levels into the game, taking place on Sky City, featuring Planet Sirius, the homeworld of Mental, seem to have been finished if not very close. You can spot Sam killing several enemies on these once uninhabited maps, showcasing some enemies in action which you'd never seen in the leak build. Here we can spot Sam decimating some cyborgs with the Ghostbuster weapon, taking heavy fire from a minor biomech, or rather a walker, as it is called here. This level is possibly a more developed iteration of Sirius Gravitality's layout. A couple of the Sky City levels were made after the 2000 Alpha build. There's also a screen capture showing gameplay in the Sacred Yards, a secret level which had made its way into the final version of the game, but is not present in the leaked build. One may wonder, do these builds still exist with these unfinished levels? Crow Team, willing to please their fans, did find several CDs at one point where they believe prototypes of the game may still exist. However, they have listed them as dead, after 12 years of being unused. There are restoration methods for CDs, we can only hope Crow Team didn't throw those out. The team behind Serious Sam Origins has these levels, as seen in their trailer, or so one would think, as after contacting their main developer, they were made up of pre-existing screenshots. On an undetermined date in 1999, Crow Team made a trailer for this early version of Serious Sam. It is now referred to as the Classic Reveal Trailer. It features a soundtrack made by the team, using the same production methods as per the Football Glory soundtrack on the Amiga. Besides this, there isn't really that much to make note of, besides a working multiplayer mode which has still yet to be understood in the leaked early build of Sirius Sam. Whether such a thing is possible or not, as on all currently tested computers, the multiplayer option crashes the game. <laughs> This next period in time is a difficult one to elaborate on, mostly because there's so little known about it in the first place. It's more likely that the team was so busy reworking the game that they didn't have much time to show off their new developments, especially as this is very likely the time when CEO of God Games Mike Wilson was putting some strain on the team to finish it up and get it out there. Probably the most notable change in this particular era was the beheaded characters, previously called Headmen. Here they begin to take on a new design, showing resemblance to military uniforms and camouflage prints. Unfortunately, the screenshots which demonstrate these models and textures are very poor. It does, however, look like all the headmen at this point did not wear any shirts. Not too long after this, they were changed again, though perhaps it was just a change of texture. There's very little certainty I can link to these screens. Here you can see two very low resolution image icons showcasing some multiplayer gameplay besides a female Eye Man, now known as Nars, in a more developed version of Karnak. There isn't anything really worth noting here. It was during this time that the Scorp Man, now called the Arachnoid, was given a new model with a temporary texture. This made its way into the first public test, as well as the beheaded crew. The walkers were given more characteristics here, differentiating from red and gray. Gray indicated the laser walkers, and red indicated the rocket walkers. Their kick attack was also removed here as it is non-functioning in the first public test. The only known record of this attack is in the alpha build sound files. On May 30th of 2000, Crow Team released their very first demo for Serious Sam, Public Test 1. This was a big step in Crow Team's history, though it didn't appear as such right away. Most video game journalism outlets ignored the demo, and went on to cover other titles such as Sid Meier's Dinosaurs. The public test was a huge landmark. Enemies had new names, weapons had new models, or just new view models, and of course, enemies and level layout have been drastically improved upon visually. As a bit of a fun fact, the walkers were renamed Biomix here, as many other enemies were for their final design. And yet, you hear Sam Stone called Biomix Walkers in Serious Sam 3 BFE, released in 2011. This is nothing compared to walkers. Yeah, freaking walkers and techno polyps and scrap jokes. No, walkers. What the? On June 9th, 2000, Eric Wolpaw of Old Man Murray interviewed Roman Rabaric on their website. Wolpaw was a fan of Serious Sam after he played the demo. You may be more aware of Wolpaw and his other work. More so for writing Half-Life 2, the episodic series, Portal 2, and co-writing both Psychonauts games. Truly, Wolpaw has a track record of brilliance, even five years before his most notable presences in video game history. 
Rabark reflected back on the Old Man Murray interview in early of 2011 on the Rock Paper Shotgun website, referencing from John Walker's The Remarkable Notability of Old Man Murray article, where many developers commend the old site for its impact on their career. Rabark said, Doing garage development for a long time and with only limited self-funding, if it weren't for Old Man Murray and especially my crate interview with Eric, I am pretty certain we would have most likely closed our garage before finally nailing that much-needed publishing deal for Sirius Sam. But what was that publishing deal? Well, in the Old Man Murray interview, Eric Wolpaw asks Roman Rabark how much it costs to license the Sirius Sam engine. Rabark responds with, We are looking for 50 to 200k plus royalties. Black Legend has been responsible for the publishing of Crow Team's prior games, but Crow Team had other plans. Plus, Black Legend was hardly known for being affiliated with higher budget titles. The Old Man Murray interview caught the attention of a publisher called Gathering of Developers, or God Games for short. Ten years later, Crow Team still works with members from God Games, even after their troubling issues with being merged to Take-Two Interactive. That conflict turned to what remained of God Games into Gotham Games, responsible for publishing the Xbox port of Sirius Sam. From there, Take-Two closed Gotham Games, leaving the crew to create Global Star Software to publish both exclusive Nintendo titles, Sirius Sam Next Encounter for the GameCube, and Sirius Sam Advance for the Game Boy Advance. A bit of a roast was pulled up now and again through Wolpaw's words, poking fun at the state of id Software. Wolpaw admits he is often hard-hitting and unfair to Mr. John Carmack, a founder of id Software. Going on seven years, the world had yet to see the next iteration of Doom. To an outsider's perspective, one could assume Wolpaw felt Crow Team was capable of bringing forth what it had been unable to do for a rather long time, if the constant quips were anything to go by. He would now and again riff on id's company problems, losing their staff and being inferior to Crow Team's technical developments in 3D tech. Wolpaw mentions an undulating reflective blob floating in the air, from the technology test included in the demo, courtesy of Alan Ladovec, the technological leader of Crow Team. The same blob can be found in a secret unlockable path in the Karnak level in the final version of the game. Wolpaw asks Rabark if Karmak would be capable of programming such a thing. Rabark answers by first titling this reflective blob as Mental's Eyedrop, which on a side note, brings new attention to this infamous blob. Rabark believes Karmak would know how to create something similar. In fact, Rabark never had anything demeaning to say about him. This can be reflected on Crow Team's own website at the time, that they were extremely fond of id Software, being an inspiration of theirs for many years. Wolpaw sent Carmack an email saying, Alan Ladovec is the new John Carmack. To which he replied, he's the John Carmack of Croatia. With the respect and appreciation from popular icons, Crow Team began to elaborate Sirius Sam as a more developed product. A lot of content was cut in the decision to separate the game into multiple parts, as to be able to get their tech out during a period where the Sirius engine was still impressive. By this point, Sirius Sam had begun wrapping itself up. Many levels had been removed in order to complete the game at a reasonable date. There are some differences in the enemies and their designs, but at this point it is mostly cosmetic. Sam himself received his first encounter revision, ready for release. Sam's weapons, however, were still being worked on. The Tommy Gun, Laser Gun, and Grenade Launcher had a few differences here. The Tommy Gun had a somewhat different model and view model. The Laser Gun had a rough paint job look to it, with a little circle on its base. Finally, the Grenade Launcher had little to worry about, as its view model was the only element which appears to have changed at this time. With that, Sirius Sam's cycle had finally come to an end. Sirius Sam The First Encounter was released to the world on March 21st, 2001, not too long after a second public test had been set out in order to fix any remaining conflicts in computer hardware. It was certain that Sirius Sam The First Encounter, dubbed TFE, was a hit, if the overwhelming positivity was a good reference point. With God Games pushing the product, Crow Team had a fighting chance in the video game industry. On April 3rd of 2001, Roman Rabark sets up a second interview with Eric Wolpaw, again from Old Man Murray. After all, they were to thank for their publisher and overall popularity. A most notable quote is when Wolpaw addresses the announcement that Sirius Sam would have only had 15 levels rather than the originally promised 40. Rabark hints at the change being responsible to God Games CEO Mike Wilson, perhaps for giving them a time constraint to deal with, but Rabark wasn't specific in mentioning it. Just short of a paragraph later, Wolpa asked Rabark why the game launched with just one map for Sirius Sam's deathmatch multiplayer mode. Rabark said, they just didn't have the time to properly deal with the aspect of the game. This further opens the possibility of God Games pushing the release date earlier, and went on to publish alternate variations and releases for the first encounter. Firstly, there was a port of the game to the Palm operating handheld system, also for the handspring visor. It was available in either grayscale or color and featured a graphical engine with similar capabilities to Wolfenstein 3D. Its sounds were not on par with the classic shooter, however, as typically with Palm devices at the time, sound consisted of no more than computerized blips and bloops to emulate impact. It featured no music of its own, but has a minor entertainment value for those who wanted some Sam on the go. 
It featured all the original 15 levels, unlike the next variation of the game, called Serious Sam's Special Edition for the PC. Or so you would expect, until you install the game where it calls itself Serious Sam Limited Edition. Whether it was a promotional item or not is uncertain, as in fact, it's difficult to prove that it even existed as far as the internet will inform you. The only print runs spotted have been published in Canada. The Special Edition featured 7 of the 15 total levels. There isn't anything truly special about this release, in fact it is no more than an inferior product, though it does contain all of the multiplayer options of the original as well as the editors for the Sirius engine to make your own levels. The game halts once you've completed the Dunes level and takes you to the menu's high score screen. Crow Team had stumbled upon great news periodically on August 7th of the year 2000, when the company behind the Battlecruiser series, 3000 AD, licensed the Sirius Sam engine for their upcoming game under the working title, Project ABC. Unfortunately, as the time went on, the Sirius engine was less impressive and as a result, 3000 AD closed the deal as they planned for the game to utilize more impressive technology upon release. This happened much later than the first encounter's release, and doesn't play a huge role outside of the initial landmark, being the first game to, although temporarily, license the Sirius engine. Project ABC, eventually officially titled Universal Combat, went on to have many issues upon its creation on both the publishing and developing side. Crow Team was only the first of several parties to be let down by 3000 AD, but that's a story for someone else to tell. Ultimately, the closure of this licensing deal may have been disheartening for Crow Team, but the success of their first-person shooter proves that they're more than capable of progressing without them. The first encounter was the biggest landmark in Crow Team's development as a team of independent developers. From garage dwelling to respectable gaming engineers, they've shown their face in professional quality straight from the beginning. After all, this is only the first encounter. The first noteworthy milestone in the Second Encounter story is the launch of Seriously, originally a subdivision of 3D Action Planet owned by GameSpy. Seriously is the largest and most well-known Serious Sam fan forum in existence, where many users even today distribute mods, art, and more. The announcement of the forum was made on March 22, 2001. The original URL for Seriously was planetserious.com. During the summer of 2001, Patches for the first encounter were released containing a lot of netplay optimizations with little tweaks to the base game itself. Shortly after, the development for the second encounter went full flux. Not only was the base game set in motion, but due to the lackluster performance of the previous entry's multiplayer, they wanted to flesh out this aspect further in the second encounter. A modification team called A Few Screws Loose was contacted and began working a variant of their first encounter mod called Seriously Warp Deathmatch. This was done in order to launch in the retail release of the second encounter from day one. This 3.0 version of the mod would contain many new maps, modes, and two new weapons to play around with. On the internal side, Crow Team hired two new members to the crew in order to get work done faster. These two were Ivan Mika, a level designer, and Nicolo Mozedig, a programmer. The two continue to work with Crow Team to this very day. Ivan Mika made note on last year's 15th anniversary for the game that at first they had an issue with frame rates. The second encounter was, after all, going to use a slightly improved engine. It would feature a new particle system, which at the time was being held back by a duplicate line of code, which was deleted upon its discovery. With that out of the way, their newly modified engine was ready. Alas, this caused a few incompatibilities, particularly with maps from the first encounter, as the second encounter's editor was unable to import levels from the first encounter due to some newly introduced glitches in the engine. This was not much of a concern for Crow Team, but more so for the fan community which would have a much harder time importing content from the other game for their own self-made modifications. For a while, the second encounter's HUD was the same as the first encounter's, and during this period in time there were some cosmetic differences to the new second encounter weapons. The sniper rifle had a more distant view model, with its cartridge placed further back on its base. The chainsaw at this point had much larger gears. These gears did not function quite yet, as seen in the game's trailer, being the same build demonstrated in these screen captures found across the net. On December 10th of 2001, they announced a demo for Serious Sam The Second Encounter, and also announced the Gold Encounter, eventually renamed to Serious Sam Gold Edition. This was a combination of the first two games in one package. The demo for The Second Encounter was released the very next day on December 11th. The demo, at least visually, was the same as the final release, having the fully functional chainsaw gears and a closer view model on the sniper with his cartridge located closer to the front end of the weapon. On December 17th, 2001, the next edition of the Serious Monday Development Diaries was published, which was a series of development stories internally from Crow Team at the time published on their website. They announced their successful demo launch, garnering thousands of positive reactions. With publication no doubt coming soon, they began to work on the cover art for the game. Unfortunately, they came across some complications with God Games on the art, stating many things they felt were wrong with it. Some noteworthy examples are how Sam's head is too big, making him look small, and the grass wasn't detailed enough. 
With a lack of time, Crow Team shrugged off most of these suggestions, and ensured they go ahead with it anyways. It was at this point where they put a delay on the third encounter, which was at the time still relevant. The time off was spent to enjoy the holidays, a much needed break from all the work. On January 4th, 2002, the second encounter goes gold for publication, to be on shelves on February 5th. Recently beforehand, they were awarded with Game of the Year from GameSpot on the first encounter, and number one on EB Games' Best PC Games of 2001. The second encounter was released worldwide on February 5th, 2002. After the launch, the internal development was focused on patching the game to further optimize web code, as they had done previously with the first encounter. As of last year's 15th anniversary for the game, we were told that at this point they had rented a much bigger office, which they used as an excuse to get more staff. This was for a project that was soon to be announced. When that announcement took place specifically isn't known, considering on August 1st of 2002, the site makes its first mention of the upcoming Xbox port of Serious Sam's first and second encounters. Somewhere between the lines it must have been announced, as it was mentioned here without any fanfare. The team announces the changes made for the Xbox port. The gameplay would be changed to better suit a console, auto-aiming had been introduced, and the quality of almost every model would be increased. On October 18th, 2002, they edit their post with new information. The post goes into further detail with the combination of the two encounters, making for one fluid experience of 36 single-player levels. At this point, the idea is to create the third encounter, which had been scrapped entirely in making for a second entry, acknowledging the first two games as one game. This can be confirmed by the end of the post, where they state that they'll be continuing development on the full-blown sequel, Serious Sam 2. The Xbox port introduced a very significant difference to the previous games, and Crow Team didn't shrug it off as a minor difference. What happened to Sam, it reads. Our man Sam has undergone some facial and body lifting to fit the superhero action style intended for the consoles. Whatever this meant is unclear, but what was is that Crow Team wanted the console port to have a more cartoony, comic book styled approach. This they called their serious cartoony look, trademarked, which would make its way into many future installments. The box art for the Xbox port wasn't always as it appears today, an earlier design Crow Team threw together featured Sam punching the head off a cucurbito, but it wasn't approved in the publication department. Apparently, this was due to it being too violent. On September 23rd, 2003, we begin to hear less about Serious Sam the Second Encounter and more about this full sequel called Serious Sam 2. The new game was to be released for both PC and Xbox, developing both from the start much unlike the Xbox port of the first two encounters. The remaining information archived on Crow Team's website focuses more on the development for Serious Sam 2, ending their focus on the Serious Sam classics. Though there was still some communication going on between Crow Team and Climax, a company which wanted to take a stab at an encounter of their own using the same style of the classics. This encounter was on two different platforms, which had since been absent of Sam's Carnage. Serious Sam Next Encounter came out on April 12th of 2004 for the Nintendo GameCube in the US, with a European release coming five days later. The PlayStation 2 release came on the 22nd in the US and 30th in Europe. At this point in time, the only concern Crow Team had as far as they displayed was getting Serious Sam 2 developed. It was intended to have a much bigger budget, and with that, a more experienced publisher. Its development doesn't have much to show, as their newly acquired publisher, 2K, wanted to, quote-unquote, keep things under wraps for the time being, as is stated in a Christmas update post, December 23rd, 2004. The story behind Second Encounter is much less eventful compared to what came before it. While making a sequel is hard work, it can't compare to the true accomplishment of bringing a brand new IP to the table. Serious Sam's debut was very successful, and brought upon years of success to come from the independent developers at Crow Team. To this day, Crow Team continues to make games in the Serious Sam series without any signs of stopping. From full-blown sequels to HD remakes, fan projects, and VR, They've shown their diversity and possibilities, and demonstrated a keen eye for what's trending and successful. Whether you be a fan of the series or not, there is no denying the serious dedication this little Croatian team brought to the world of video gaming.
Here comes trouble! 